a lot of people, I feel like, got into the business around 2020 when they saw things were stupid easy and they were like, oh, I can have a business, right? And they didn't do anything. And so you're going to find these agents now and people are going to have to start defining, do I want to actually learn what it means to run a business? And am I willing to put the time, money and effort to do that? Or was it a good run and I didn't have to do anything and now that I do, I should probably just go back to my corporate job. Like I think that we're gonna see a huge transition in the amount of agents on the market as well and how that is going or you know how it's, how it's changing. And I think that's gonna make a, a huge difference. And for those that don't start learning the business now, while we have a little bit of a slow moment, are going to continue to fall behind until it gets to the point to where they don't have a choice but to retire their license. So the question is this, how do most agents find the secrets to succeed in today's competitive real estate market, especially when the top agents are keeping those secrets to themselves? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. Hi, I'm Aaron Amuchastegui, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Hey, Real Estate Rockstars. This is Stephanie Heiser from Visalia, California, sitting with Kat Polsonelli from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Today, she's going to talk to us all about organizing and structuring your business, as well as reframing your mindset for maximum success. So what's up, Kat? What's up? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So how and why did you get into real estate? Ooh, the fun question. So I got into real estate uh, about four years ago, and uh, I was originally in medical administration, which was actually my favorite thing to do. I loved the the back end of things, the paperwork, the training, and all of that. Um, I noticed unfortunately, uh, the way that nurses and those that are in that administrative position are treated by doctors. I had a really hard time with a doctor that I worked for that unfortunately I feel like took advantage of me. And so um, I've been looking at getting into real estate at that point in time because I was a single mom and I wanted to be able to be around my kids more for the things that they were doing. And uh, when I abruptly got let go of my job, uh, I decided what the hell, right? Like I'd already been talking about it. So it was either go back into medical or do something that was for me where I could make my decisions and choose what I wanted to do and who I wanted to work with. So sounded like a great idea to me. <laughs> right. That sounds like a dream come true. So now that you're knee deep in real estate and have had a few successful years under your belt, what is different from what you imagined it would be like to what it really is like? Oh, so I feel like I had a little bit of an advantage over a lot of people uh, because I had done some sales way before um, and I'd worked in technical departments uh, before I was in medical. So I had an idea of what I was getting myself into. Um, what I didn't realize was the structure. And when you get into real estate, no matter what brokerage that you're with, while they provide a lot of tools and all the pretty fancy stuff, there isn't a lot of... Um, diving in deep and really sitting down with you to figure out your business, right? Or how to get started off on the right hand, get organized, put systems in place, teach you how to have those daily habits, and then run a successful business from there. I mean, most of the people that I that I've worked with, and including myself, didn't even realize that you could track your miles when you got into real estate, right? And you there are tax write offs that you should be looking for. So you don't have to pay in as much. So there was a lot that um that I was not aware of. And I think that was more along the systems and the structures that, to be honest, no brokerage that I have been with teaches that correctly. And so your first year in real estate, were you on a team or solo? So the first year I was actually both. I started out as a solo agent. I had three deals within the first, uh, with my third month that I had under contract and I'm closing all those deals. Wow. Um, I ended up having a 
really big change in my life. Uh, separated from someone that I had been with for four years, decided to sell my house to them. And so I made the switch to join a team, kind of like a lot of people do, because I was like, oh, they have leads. I'll get quicker deals, right? Um, so I made the switch to a team. So I was actually with a team the second half of my first year in real estate. And I did learn a ton. And I was very blessed to work under a um, expansion side of that team where I worked specifically with one listing agent and I was her buyer's agent and I learned everything uh, from her and that team. And then um, you said you ended up having a corporate position. How did that happen? Yeah. So uh, after being with the team for about six months, I'm usually really good about realizing whether or not I enjoy something within about six months. So uh, I was on the team for about six months. Um, I loved the structure and what they provided. Unfortunately, I did not care for the buy side and I was not allowed to do anything else. I'm also not a cold caller. I can do it. I just don't care to. Um, and their regulations or rules on their team was a hundred calls per day, but it had to be contacts, not just phone calls, um, script practice five days a week. Uh, so it was very, very structured and it works really well for a lot of people. And I figured with me being a very structured person, it would work. What I quickly realized was cold calling is not what I would like to do, right? I'd rather be outdoor knocking or being in front of people. So in the midst of all that, I had a conversation with uh, the team lead that was at the brokerage I was at at the time, which is one of the largest brokerages in the world. And I was offered a position to come in and take over their agent coordinating position. So I worked in the Murfreesboro office uh, with about 250 agents uh, at any given time. And I did everything from onboarding new agents to pulling old agents over from other brokerages, setting them up in systems. Uh, at the time that I took the position, we also transitioned from using Dotloop to DocuSign. And so I learned the whole back end of DocuSign and I did all the training. So I would teach agents as they came in. I did small groups. At that time, we went into COVID as well. So everything was virtual for a while. Uh, so I would teach classes and I fell in love with that process, which is what I fell in love with when I was in the medical field, uh, teaching people, training, learning the things and helping people skip kind of ahead of what I had to learn. Uh, so I did that for about a year on top of doing some sales in the process. And then Agent Services Plus was born. Great. So tell me more about Agent Services Plus. What's that? Yeah. So Agent Services Plus essentially is, uh, I call it a business management consulting company. And the reason I say that is because if you come across as a coach, I feel like a lot of people get confused. Um, a lot of coaches in the industry are known for those to help you with your numbers and do all of that. My specialty is actually coming in and helping you set your business up and run it the way you need to. So for instance, uh, I worked with a team for a while. She'd been in business for 16 years and they were booming with business. But the one thing that she never had time to actually sit down and create was the back end. So her CRM was a little bit of a mess. The um, Some of the organizing things that needed to be done were not where they should be, but they were so busy doing what they're great at, right, which is selling and taking care of clients. They didn't have a chance to fix all of that. So I actually came in and met with their administrative team. They had... Um, um, a full-time uh, person at that point in time that worked with them. And so I sat with the team leader and then I sat with their admin and had a conversation of understanding their personalities first. That's a huge piece for me. I love to learn people's personalities. And what I learned from that was you can figure out how people can actually work better together if they understand each other on every level, right? So your communication could be a little bit different um, that makes it a lot more seamless because you're working a little bit to help your admin who works on a totally different level, right? So if you've got someone that, in my opinion, is what I call a high eye, and they're just really outgoing and they've got tons of ideas and you have someone that's your admin that say looks very structured. If you just brain dump everything onto them, they're going to be completely overwhelmed and not want to do the job, right? So I got to come in and help kind of actually piece that together and create this amazing marriage basically with both of them that allowed the agent to be the agent, but to do things in a way that actually correlated with the way that her admin ran so that she didn't feel so overwhelmed because of the differences in personalities. So that's what I get to get to do is I get to come in and build from the background and kind of fix that foundation where there's probably a lot of cracks, especially those that got into the business back in 2020, right? Because you didn't really have to have systems and follow-ups or anything. You could just go out and sell a house and it, right. was, it was pretty easy. 
So a lot of people are missing that structure piece. That's me for sure. In my own business, I got licensed in 2020 and I had no clue. Like I could have never dreamed of selling 54 houses my first year. I had no clue I would end up flipping several houses after that. Like my life drastically changed. And it's so weird because in my classroom and as a vice principal, I was super, super organized and I knew all of my students, I knew their reading levels, their math ability. I knew what was going on at home. I knew who needed a hug and who needed just a stern teacher face. And in real estate, I cannot wrap my head around how to get organized or structure my day to save my life. But Mm -hmm. I also use the excuse like, well, I couldn't possibly ever take on more business. Like I'm so, 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 so busy. But I know that is just the lamest excuse ever. So what would be step number one? If someone comes to you and says like, hey, I got the real estate part down. What do I do to like survive and get organized? What would you tell them for their first tip? Yeah. So I would have to say that especially with someone like you that really kind of like boomed in their business and they know that they've got so many transactions that are keeping them super busy. My first piece of advice is going to be, what do you love doing in your business? And what do you wish you really didn't have to do in the business? Right. And from there, see if we can't find some ways to delegate some of those pieces off of you. Right. So like one of the first things that a lot of people should do in their business once they start getting busy and understand how a contract goes from start to finish is hire a TC, right? Then you're not dealing with the paperwork. You're not dealing with the in-between emails that need to go back and forth and making sure things are signed. You can take that client, deal with them the way you need to, handle them however, whatever additional comes up, correct, and then also be able to move on to the next one. So that's a huge piece, right? So TC, take that paperwork off the back end. Go ahead and get rid of that. Focus on what you're great on. The next thing would be for someone of your size that has that much, what's the next step in your business of things you would like to be able to let go of, right? If it's social media and um, follow up or touching base with your database and you don't have time to do those text messages and phone calls, who can we hire to bring in to help alleviate that from you and train them to work the way that you do so that your clients are still getting the full experience of you? Awesome. And so I am actually there. I'm just taking this opportunity to pretend I'm here helping everyone else out, but I just want to know for myself. So I hired a VA that I actually really love, spent so much time training them. We got everything about ready to launch. And then they started having tons of technical difficulties and the company that hired them for me, let them go. So At least now I have SOPs in place and I know exactly what I need them to do. But how Mm -hmm. do you find a good VA or an ISA even that um, doesn't have as much of a language barrier? Because I see so many agents posting on social media and it's obviously not them. And the location tag will be like a different country Mm-hmm. And I understand like the labor's cheaper, whatever, but I would rather just get like a college kid who grew up on this stuff and can do it so easily. But how do you find some good help? Yeah. So I think that it, every person is different, right? So it depends on what you need in your business. It also depends on how much money you can spend on that person, right? So if you can find a college student or for a lot of people, like I did, I have teenagers, He's 18. He knows how to work things. I was like, great, you're going to help mom, right? <laughs> Cheap labor. Um, for, for other people that don't have the ability to just hire, you know, a college student or someone that, that may be expecting a lot more as far as pay. Uh, there are all kinds of things that are out there. Um, Upwork and a company called Fiverr, which is F I V E R R.com. Um, those are two really great ones. Some people will go with um, VA companies, uh, which is fantastic. Again, it, comes down to how much money you're able to spend, right? Because I know that for some of the VA companies that find people for you and hire them out, there's a larger overhead, right? And not everybody can spend three to four grand a month 
on a full-time VA. If you're just getting into it and you're needing someone for, let's say, like social media or to make phone calls, but 10 hours a week, right? Then those companies that let's say only allow for 40 hours a week is not going to work for you. What I would suggest is if you are going on other companies, um, like the two that I mentioned, where you can find people is to ask them for a piece of their work, right? If you say that you're able to do this, can you show me, right? Can you give me a piece that you've done before? Or if I were to do this, can I give you an example and then you answer? My other suggestion would be, especially when you're using someone that's, let's say, is overseas. Um, if it's an ISA, you definitely need to make sure that they do have a really decent English, right? Because it makes it very hard for people and for that language barrier. Um, you can create scripts for them, though, right? That you can work with them to make sure that they understand that script and they're better at having that conversation on that level because that's where they're staying, right? Same thing when you have... Uh, let's say a VA that's going to be answering your emails or texting people through your social media, you can create text boxes, right? Or scripts where they just copy and paste it to start that conversation. And then from there, you can teach them the flow of how you would respond, right? So you can give them little responses that you save on, let's say like a Google Drive. And if, hey, if this is a question that people are normally coming up with, like here's a generalized answer, right? So you're helping them. I think that that is the biggest piece when it comes to hiring someone, whether it's in the United States or outside of the United States is communication with that person that you hired. You can't take someone and expect them to just know how to run your business. So if you aren't willing to take the time to teach them, work with them, have weekly meetings with them to be like, hey, how are you doing? How is this going? Where do you feel like you need help with? And then actively help them. You're going to struggle through that the entire process, no matter how good of someone is. Yeah. And I really think it's important to know that you have to be yourself. And when you're hiring someone to basically imitate you, you have to make sure it's someone you vibe with and someone that mm -hmm. will convey your personality and what makes you stand out. I see a lot of agents will use like the same company that gives them different social media posts. And I was like scrolling mindlessly through social media and I see the same post like, wait, what? That was five different agents with the same exact post today. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, you're not the only agent that someone in your market is following. And yeah. if you're all doing the same vanilla crap, like you're not going to differentiate. Yeah. So it's really important when you start sending your work to someone else to communicate like you said because you have to make it sound like you or maybe like you know do all the work on the front end and communicate so that way when your VA just sets everything in motion they know like you recorded the videos they edit it they send it out to email they send it on all the different social media platforms that's you on video. You just didn't have to click the buttons and pay for yep. the targeted ads. Mm -hmm. So I just wish I could like encourage everybody to just be your damn self. Like stop copying or just signing up for like keeping current matters is really great information and really super mm -hmm. easy to use. But add more to that, add your spin, record yeah. a video of you talking about the latest thing that came out and or having keeping current matters or any other like automated social media is awesome. And it really does help save you a lot of time and energy. And there is only so much we could say about real estate. Like we're all yeah. talking about the same stuff, but then like have your personality out there, like just be you and your vibe attracts your tribe. Like I love working with, I mean, really all kinds of people, but someone that's super stuffy and would be like super offended by the word shit probably shouldn't work with me. And it's <laughs> fine. It's totally cool. There's plenty of agents in my market that would never, ever, ever say the S word. So it's perfect. There's someone for everyone and we don't all have to get along perfectly with everyone or be the perfect match for everybody. Yeah. But I think being true to yourself 
is, in my opinion, the very best thing about our business. Like you said, working with that evil doctor, and I talked about the god awful principle that I had to work with. And I can fire any client I want to. I don't have to take you to the finish line. I can refer you out. I can tell you to go figure it out yourself. Yeah, I've done that maybe like three times. I can pretty much tolerate anyone. But I had one client that like screamed at me, like literally lost his mind because, yeah, (laughs) the listing agent wanted to take his offer, but she wanted him to get cross-qualified or use a trusted local lender. And he was qualified with one of those big online companies that you see commercials for. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, you're you're paying them a whole lot of extra money. Like, why are you worried about getting cross-qualified? And he's like, my lender said that's a violation of fair housing. Like, no, it's not. This agent, even it's like an agent owner, like they know what they're doing and they are yeah. super ethical. But we all know way more about lenders than you do, homeboy. <laughs> but he was screaming at me. So after that, I'm like, so sorry, you're not getting this house and you're not getting this agent. Yeah. But have you ever had to fire anybody? I I had one that I, I didn't necessarily fire. I made it through the closing, um, but I immediately told them afterward that um, I was going to be moving into my business and wouldn't be doing real estate as much anymore. So if they ever needed help, I'd be happy to refer them out, but I would not be able to take their business anymore. Um, that So I have, I have had to do that one time, um, but I've been very lucky in my, in my business to not have to deal with a ton of jerks, I guess you could say, Um, (laughs) or, you know, like I've had it where it happens in the very beginning when you're still having conversations. And then I just like, stop responding. (laughs) I'm like, never mind, never mind. You can just (laughs) <laughs> I, I fell off the face of the earth and go find someone else. <laughs> so you ghost your, your potential clients. I have. Yeah, I've had to before. I have never really had anyone that has just been extremely disrespectful to me um, through the process. And at the same time, the few that I have had that have gotten, let's say, not really irate, but just irritated, like feeling like they're not being heard. I've dealt with enough people, um, especially being in the medical field, to take a step back and be like, look, I understand that you're frustrated. I understand what you're going through. But the whole reason that you hired me is because you trust what I am telling you. So either I can continue doing my job and we can have a conversation and you can trust me or you can fight me the whole way. And I guarantee you something's going to fall apart. And more than likely, you're probably going to be on your own again. So I'm also very blunt with every person that I work with and any person that wants to work with me, I always tell everyone the first time that they meet me is I come with a disclaimer and my disclaimer is (laughs) I am blunt and I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And if I don't agree with what you're saying, I'm going to tell you that and we can have a conversation around it. If you are offended by that, or if it bothers you, if you're looking for someone to sugarcoat it, I am not your agent. Hey, real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Buchastegui, and I'm interrupting myself to bring you this commercial break from one of our sponsors. There's somebody I've been looking at for a long time, and when they reached out to me, I said, yes, we have to be able to do this deal. So that sponsor is Follow Up Boss. There's a lot of superstars out there that use Follow Up Boss. What's your favorite CRM? We're using Follow Up Boss. So we use Follow Up Boss. So we use Follow Up Boss. I love Follow Up Boss. I love it. We have action plans now for bringing on new agents. We have action plans for our recruiting. Uh, We call them action plans and follow-up boss, which will trigger tasks for the agents to do as far as calling. Follow-up boss, I like more for the integrations with everything, MailChimp, call action, all those different products. I will say we used Sync and we switched from Sync to follow-up boss. Honestly, the greatest CRM I've ever used, I've used Rivety Sync. I've looked at Boomtown like Real Geeks, just a bunch of different ones. But me personally, I fell in love with Fub about like seven months ago when I first started using it. I've used Boomtown. I've used Line Desk. I've used Conversion. And I think Follow Up Boss gives you the most integrations mm-hmm. that are simple. And it gives you the best ability to go and integrate large things into one single solitary platform. 
yet at the same time, it's still affordable. I do like Follow Up Boss better just because it you can text from the app and things like that. It's just a little more convenient for me. Um, it tracks everything that I need. I can customize it if I want. If I want to go smart list based, that's fine. If I want to go task based, it's fine. I think it's one of the best systems and it's very user friendly. It just really helps me never drop a ball because it, it's so user friendly. I don't have a one horse in the race with Follow Up Boss. Purely objective, Follow Up Boss has been the best one that we've found. Now I've used Follow Up Boss. We've actually used it in our non real estate businesses as well because it's so good at being able to set timers, set automatic texting and emailing. So here's what we got. For Real Estate Rockstars listeners, you get a 30 day free trial. That's normally 14 days. So in order to get this, you go followupboss.com, just like it sounds, forward slash rockstars. Go there, get your 30 day free trial and check it out. Especially if you aren't using any systems or any CRMs yet, this will be a great one for you to start with. Thanks again. Now back to our show. <laughs> That's, That's my disclaimer. That's it. That's exactly it. I'm like, hey, um, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear because that's not good for you and it's not good for me and I don't have time for this. Yeah. And especially right now, sellers who want 2021 prices or early 22 prices, like you're not getting that. I'm so sorry, but you're like six months too late. Mm -hmm. So how is the market in Murfreesboro? And if it has changed, how are you handling sellers and buyers with the higher interest rates. How are you navigating the changes? So I feel like we've we've seen a little bit of a dip where it's, in my personal opinion, it's kind of like even things out, right? Where before your sellers just had absolutely every bit of hold above you. And now we're back to that buyer's market, which is where I started out. It was a buyer's market when I came into real estate. Um, so I have seen prices go down, but not necessarily go down because the market is dropping. It's because people had overpriced their crap to begin with. And so now they're having to catch back up with where the market actually stands, right? So we do see the higher prices because the appraisals and everything came in and that's just brought the market up. But those that are still overpricing their crap um, is definitely sitting a lot more. Now we have seen a lot of people fall out of the buying process because of it being that, you know, six, 7% kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, for a lot of buyers, we've had to get unique in the way that we do things, right. In the way that we structure things. And this is where I feel like it comes down to who you are partnered with. Right. So I know that a lot of brokerages have like their own lender that they work with, you know, especially if you're in like a brick and mortar, right? They have their in-house lender. That's great. Like, don't get me wrong. The problem with that is, is if you only have one lender and that's like your go-to, you are screwing your clients, right? Not every lender yeah. is made the same. Not every bank is made the same. I have some lenders that specialize in land only deals, right? I have some that specialize in being able to work with manufactured homes. Every person is different. I have a lender that's actually fantastic with those that are moving from out of state that are self-employed, right? So you need to be able to have people at your back that can help your clients depending on what's going on in their lives. And that also means you as an agent have to learn who your client is, right? So that means you have to have a conversation. You have to talk to them. You have to get to know them. You can't just be like, oh, okay, great. We're going to get you pre-approved. Here's some lenders, right? You should have a generalized idea of where your person should go in the very beginning when you're having that conversation. If you're not, you're honestly doing a very big disservice to your client because if they go to one lender or let's say that in-house lender and then they don't get approved, now they're upset, right? But there could be another lender right here beside you that's like, oh, I can approve them. So giving them options and knowing where they're coming from is a huge thing. That means communication. Guess what? That's part of our job. We didn't have to have it in 2020. People just did whatever. Communication <laughs> right. is key in this market now, right? Communication with your lender, understanding what they can offer and what they can't offer. And let me just give everybody a, a big tip whether it's your lender, your title company, whoever the case may be, if you are using them and you are constantly having to correct their shit or you're constantly having to make up excuses because they can't get it done, get rid of them. It's a Fire business. them. <laughs> it is a business decision. It's not a personal decision. I don't care if they're your best friend. If they suck or their company sucks, guess what? 
That's your person that you're putting out there to promote your business in the way that you do things. So if you continue to promote that person and you look like shit because your lender can't handle their shit, right? So find those people that you can communicate with that work beside you and get your clients to where they need to be. And I don't mean like, oh, I can close the deal on time. Great. That's your damn job. Fantastic. I'm supposed to get my people to the closing table too. Um, but you need to find people that can work with your clients. So knowing who your clients are is going to be a huge thing within this market and being able to communicate with everybody, whether it's your lender, your title company, your client, the agent on the other side, stop looking at the agent on the other side as your competition. They run a damn business like you do, right? It's like ice cream shops fighting because my ice cream is better than your ice cream. Some people's going to like this ice cream and some people's going to like that. We're all together, right? And we as agents, I feel like do not understand that on a large level at all <laughs> in the business. Yeah, for sure. But that's a great point, even for people I mean, for agents that would be listening, like you really need to have a really good team. And right now, who you work with matters so much as a client, as an agent, everybody like clients right now, if you're just um, picking an agent that is like a mom on your kid's soccer team and they sell like one house a year, that's not the agent that is going to know the way to navigate a changing market. They are not knee deep in this to know that you can have a 2-1 interest rate buy down. They're not going to know which lenders mess it all up or which lenders get us to the closing table. They won't know which lender to send their clients to. Like I have a local lender that all the listing agents love. Actually, she was the one that was requested from the super sweet agent selling their gorgeous home when that psycho guy was screaming at me. Well, she's an excellent lender. She, I mean, you read all the private notes in our MLS. They all want cross-qualified or pre-approved by her because if she qualifies them, they're qualified. <laughs> but I've had clients that didn't qualify through her. So I send them to a different lender that maybe has different strategies and tools in their tool belt. And mm -hmm. that's fine. They're all great. And I love them so much. We have some killer agents in um, Central California and some killer loan officers too. So I'm very blessed to work in a really good place. And having good rapport with other agents is very, very important. Because yeah. like you said, like there's no competition, especially like when we're in a transaction together. Like our goal is to get to the finish line. If you're, Close the deal. <laughs> yeah. Like if your seller is being stubborn and wasting all of our time over like a hundred dollar repair. Okay, fine. Then that's on you to call the plumber, put in the new like pressure valve for $85. Who cares? Just do it and yeah. save us all the headache and save yourself the time and energy and move on to the next client. Like let's yeah. wrap this up so we can go help and serve more people. So I love when I submit offers, I get feedback often. It used to surprise me. And now I just, um, it makes me smile, <laughs> but they're like, Oh, I really want to work with you. I know you'll get it to the finish line. And, um, I said that to Jonathan Spears when I was interviewing him on here, um, man, almost a year ago. He's like, yeah, everybody says that though. I'm like, no, they don't no. because there's a lot of agents that I'm like, oh man, I hope we get another offer on this house because if that agent's representing the buyer, I'm doing all the work times yeah. 10 because this person is a bozo and a jerk. So yeah, who you work with matters a billion percent, especially right now. Are your days on market increasing at all? Oh, yeah, dramatically. Uh, now, I will say that um, for us, what used to be um, the medium price range in this area, which was about 250 to 300, we're starting to see those still moving. But if you're like over 500,000, we're definitely seeing that sit a lot longer where before um, the market took a change even at 500, 600, and 700,000, we were still seeing them.
flip pretty quickly. So now we're starting to, to kind of level out. And I, I really do think that a lot of that is because those that, let's say, were pre-approved before for 500000 when those rates kicked up, it dropped them, right? So now we're back in a, in a different category. And so that's that's been the biggest shift that I've I've seen here. And a lot of people don't understand that, whether it's agents or those that are looking to buy and sell. And so trying to have those conversations can be very cumbersome for a lot of people because it, it's like talking math to a two-year-old sometimes. That's what I feel, that's what I feel like. like you know, <laughs> You try so hard, but we understand it or we should understand yeah. our market and kind of what's going on. But then sometimes being able to relay that to a client doesn't always work, right? Or so relaying it to-, to other agents. And I think that's a really intelligent um, assessment of the market stats because like, for example, in our market last month, the average price point jumped about $30,000. But I mean, our prices surely are not going up right now, but there were less closings and the few that closed were at higher price points. Mm -hmm. But this month, I mean, there might be a lot more houses that close that were like lower price points. It doesn't, like you have to take the market data and really analyze it. So statistics to me, I sw- always have said this, I swear my whole life. So statistics don't mean shit, but of course they do. And they do give us an in-depth look into what's going on, but you have to think about it deeper than just the surface numbers that you see. So yeah. sure prices are down compared to last year. Listings are um, in a lot of places, actually, we have a lot more listings compared to last year. Yeah. But we're comparing like to the most insane, unsustainable, unprecedented market ever. Like, in my opinion, rates should have never been two and a half percent. That yeah. was stupid. Like this mess was bound to happen because when your interest rate is lower than just general inflation every year, all the people with a ton of money are dumping all their cash into real estate. And then all of the regular people who just want to buy their first house or downsize didn't stand a chance. So now that there's a lot less competition, it's such a bummer that rates went up so super fast because prices haven't dropped enough to make your monthly payment level out. But without the added competition, like I, there's still motivated sellers out there. I have clients um, that my, like my last three closings, the appraisals have come in at least 20,000 higher than our offer price. Nice. Yeah. One of them was 56,000 higher than what our purchase price was. Wow. Yeah. Real estate rock stars, this is Aaron Muchastegui. Thank you for letting me interrupt for a second. I've got something really, really important to talk about. You know how last year we kept talking about that mastermind? What is the mastermind? What are we talking about with that mastermind? Last May, there were like 60 or 70 people of you listeners that had never met, flew out to Austin, Texas. We all hung out at this awesome event center and we spent a couple days with some great guest speakers talking about skills and strategies to succeed in real estate. And then we had these mastermind tables where everyone rotated, everyone got to meet everybody, everyone got to provide value. Some of the agents there had only done one or two deals ever. Some of the agents there had done hundreds of deals and they all got to interact and help each other build their business and build their strategies. And I've heard so many stories of friendships that came from that, of referrals that have come from that. There were six or seven people at that one that heard me talk about doing an Ironman and we all did an Ironman together in in North Carolina last month and we had never even met before the podcast live so the it was it's, it's been such such a cool experience the i would love it for you guys to come today is march 6 through 8 the sign ups right now go to hybendigital.com forward slash mastermind we also have a room block set up it's three days downtown austin great really cool hotel really cool uh, convention center that we're going to be hosting it and we're going to get a chance to i can't wait to meet you guys i can't wait for you to meet other listeners i can't wait for you to develop these new interactions and really what we're teaching yeah last year was like how do you make a business better but the market was just starting to turn and i was trying to give some people some advice of what to do when it when it was happening now it has turned and this time we're going to be talking so much about how to pivot and what to do next so 
Uh, again, I hope you signed up for the mastermind. Sorry for such the long advertisement, but I can't wait to meet you. Ibendigital.com forward slash mastermind. But of course, that'll change as we get deeper and deeper into the inflation. We'll have appraisals start catching up and yep. getting, yep. you know, creeping down. So if you're pricing your listings right now, don't price them based on 90 days ago. That is irrelevant information. You need to price them. I do my comps like 30 to 45 days back instead of 90 now because yeah. 90 days ago it was a different world. And now um, I just listed a house for like 20,000 less than what the seller like dreamed of having for it. Like, no, I mean, that was a stretch a few months ago, but now yeah. like your similar house just closed for $340,000, like identical. It's a neighborhood where they're all the same. So sure, we'll try to get 370. We'll see what happens, but we're not getting 390. Like yeah. there's just not, but I mean, luckily she's super reasonable and extremely sweet. And I'm so blessed to have her as a client and I can't wait to see how that listing develops. But I have other sellers that are Airbnb owners, mm -hmm. you know, selling their property and their pricing is good. It's just good for a business because, yeah. you know, you're buying a business when you're buying an Airbnb, but using a mortgage loan to buy an Airbnb is kind of not working right now. Like if you're a cash yeah. buyer, you're getting some killer deals on Airbnbs right now. But those sellers aren't willing to go down as much because they're covering their mortgage and making profit on their Airbnb bookings. So that really, really is impacting my Joshua Tree market and the Three Rivers market by Sequoia National Park. Do you guys have... Short-term rentals, is that a big thing in Murfreesboro? Uh, not necessarily in Murfreesboro. We're, we're starting to see it in different areas, but we also have a lot of restrictions depending on where you're at, right? So a lot of neighborhoods have kind of put a cap on that real quick. Mm -hmm. um, even like in Nashville, there's only so many uh, permits that go out each year and it, there's never a guarantee, right? So they're, they're really kind of like Tennessee's kind of keeping a tight knit. <laughs> now, there have been some people that have had some unique ways around having an Airbnb, per se, right? Um, but we're starting to see it pop up in our area more than, than what it used to, especially like around our parks, um, the lakes that we have and things like that. But then again, depending on the county, um, there are some counties that are extremely strict and don't allow anything like that. And then there's others that are like, yeah, we don't really care whatever you do. Right. Um, so we have a really big mix in, in my personal opinion. That's awesome. I think in Joshua tree, well, not, I think I know it, there were tons of Airbnbs. I mean, at least 90% of my transactions were Airbnb. I'd say at least 75, 80 of the sales in the last three years in the Joshua Tree area have all been for vacation rental purposes. And I'm personally, wow. yeah, huge, huge, huge. And the prices skyrocketed over 66%. And that is ridiculous. Like that market alone is a great microcosm to study the impact that short-term rental can have. And yeah. I personally am not for like government regulation. I just don't think they ever really do it properly. And I just think live and let live, whatever. Yeah. But then they abruptly change the rules. And after allowing permits to transfer from buyer, seller to buyer, now you cannot transfer your permits anymore. Wow. So, yeah. So that is making the values of your Airbnb drop significantly because mm -hmm. now they have to get on a wait list and the house passed inspection. And I think the permit should stay with the house, not with yeah. the owner because it's the that house. Like, <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense at all. And they just, brought that market to a screeching halt. But the prices yeah. were so astronomical because of the lack of oversight to begin with. And then in Tulare County near Sequoia National Park, 
the regulations are pretty much non-existent. You just get a business license every year. You pay your 10% TOT tax. That's the transient occupancy tax. And our market has remained much more stable. We're still, you know, people are able to transfer their permits and Mm -hmm. It just the market speaks for itself and it didn't just suddenly tank nearly as badly as the desert did. So I'm always curious to see how short term rentals impact things. So I'm going to guess that in Murfreesboro, you guys have a much more stable market than we're seeing in Southern California because you don't have a billion short term rentals kind of changing everything. I think that if you're if you're looking at short term rentals or Airbnbs, that's going to be more in East Tennessee, where you've got like Gatlinburg and the mountains and everything like that. But not not so much in in Middle Tennessee, as far as that. So you were talking about mindset, and I was listening to your episode on the Real Marketer podcast, and I really really loved it, and. I was so excited to dig deeper into that with you. And, you know, like talking about mental health and talking about just, I mean, physical health, everything is my passion, Mm -hmm. but, and I'm all about a positive mindset, but sometimes I think that fluffy bullshit doesn't help us. Like some days are hard. Some days you want to cry. Some situations are just scary and some are super, super sad So what is your philosophy around mindset and being a real estate agent and surviving, like being a business owner and an entrepreneur and keeping up with all the things you have to manage? (laughs) Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, So I definitely think for me personally, uh, and for a lot of people that I've worked with, that mindset is a huge piece of your business and your personal life. And the reason being is because however your mindset is in your personal life is going to ultimately affect how you run your business life, right? So you could say, oh, you know, my business is doing great. I I know what I'm doing. But if you have like a crash and burn in your personal life, depending on how you deal with that is also going to bleed over into how you deal with your business, right? So if you don't know how to mentally handle the things that you're going through there, it's going to bleed. Same thing in your business. If you have a really, really bad day in your business and you don't know how to de-stress, talk about it, let it go, find a safe space or safe people to have the conversation with. And I don't necessarily mean just a bitch fest all the time, right? Yeah, great. Venting is great, but sometimes you need to learn from it in order to get over it. So bitching doesn't always work. So, but the same thing, right? If you have issues and things in your business and you don't know how to handle it, you're going to then bleed that into your personal life. And that's going to affect who you're with, your kids, like everything. So it's, it's, to me, it's very intertwined in, in everything. And mindset is a huge piece of how you deal with things on a day to day basis. And like you said, the, the fluffy, you know, just think positive shit doesn't always work. Right. What I like to do, what I like to use on the people that I work with on the personal development side of my business is finding the small things so that you can change how you think of things. Right. So give me an example. For instance, A huge thing that a lot of us say, right, is when you've had kind of a crappy day, right? You come home, they're like, oh, how was your day? It was shit. It sucked. It was horrible. My question is, was it the whole day or was it a piece of your day? So if, let's say you got up early, you got to where you needed to go, your client was late, right? Not a big deal. Put you a little bit behind. Um, But lunch was fine, right? You had some great conversations, but then crap fell apart on a deal and shit kind of went south. Um, but you got home in time for dinner. That was on a shit day. You had moments in your day that was shit and that's fine. Right. Acknowledge that. But changing the way that you say things affects the way that it goes internally and how your mind processes it. So then you can turn back and say, well, it wasn't my day, but like this part of my day sucked. But Like I still got this done. I did make some great connections and I made that 10 time for dinner, right? Like I'm normally late. So you have to take things like that where we like to use blanketed statements 
and piece it apart to peel it back to figure out if that statement is actually true or if we just use it because as a society, that's what everybody uses. Yeah, that reminds me of in the classroom and even in staff meetings. I always thought it was super bizarre that in education, like the staff is also like treated like we're in third grade. (laughs) But we would say, what were two glows and a grow? So if you just think of your day, like what were two good things and then one bad thing or in your business, what are two things that you're doing really well and one thing that you can fix? So what one thing should you focus on this week? What one thing I always like to organize my, I guess my goals, (laughs) my grows and glows into months. Like this month, I'm not drinking soda. And that's my goal. And my goal is like 15,000 steps a day. I mean, that's probably like a nothing goal for everyone that's way more active than I am. But to force myself to make time for myself, and obviously I have way less open escrows than I normally do. Thank God, because I am just beyond exhausted. But to just focus and like, did I like spend time on me today? Am I bringing my healthiest self to my marriage? Like, am I showing up to my marriage and to my business in the best way that I can? Or am I just drowning and overwhelmed and exhausted? Well, I'm drowning, overwhelmed and exhausted, I swear, 90% of the time. (laughs) But, you know, now I think this changing market is a really big blessing to so many of us because, you know, especially with the holidays coming and then everybody makes a New Year's resolution. But really, for real, like sit, stare yourself in the mirror, have the hard thoughts and conversations, like how can you improve yourself because you are your business. So you need to take care of yourself and put on your oxygen mask before everyone else's. But anyone who has had transactions in the last two, three years, man, it's been so crazy. I know all my escrow officers and lenders are like, oh my gosh, I can't wait. I'm going to Hawaii next week (laughs) and I can finally just relax. Like everyone can finally breathe. Like I might spend Thanksgiving with my family without my phone. I may Uh not. (laughs) Yeah, maybe. I may write like zero offers on Christmas Eve. Like the last two Christmas Eves, I have gotten offers accepted and written offers. Like I showed houses before I drove five hours to my parents' house on Christmas Eve. And like, I don't want to do that ever again. What, what did that change in my life? Like that Christmas with my parents is worth so much more, but I think we're all going to have a little rude awakening on how we can improve our businesses and improve our systems But take advantage because I personally don't think the market will be this slow for very long. I mean, I think it'll be a good six months that we can breathe. But I think that as a lot of the agents that didn't do many transactions, they're just going to fall off. So at the other end, it's going to be those of us that are still marketing, still paying for our mailers, still Mm -hmm. on video we're going to be busy again. So what do you think about the state of the market and the future of the market? I definitely agree with you. I don't, I don't think that we're going to stay in like this weird transition, right? We're in a transition and that's how I see it. What I do think is going to happen is it's going to allow things to kind of even back out. And not only with your market, you're going to see that sellers are going to have to learn how to negotiate again and be okay with that. Your buyers are going to now be able to breathe because they have that ability to be able to do that. And then you're also going to see it within the agents as well. Because like you said, a lot of people, I feel like got into the business around 2020 when they saw things were stupid easy and they were like, oh, I can have a business, right? And they didn't do anything. And so you're going to find these agents now and people are going to have to start defining, do I want to actually learn what it means to run a business? And am I willing to put 
the time, money, and effort to do that? Or was it a good run and I didn't have to do anything? And now that I do, I should probably just go back to my corporate job. Like, I think that we're going to see a huge transition in the amount of agents on the market as well and how that is going or you know how it's how it's changing and I think that's going to make a, a huge difference and for those that don't start learning the business now while we have a little bit of a slow moment are going to continue to fall behind until it gets to the point where they don't have a choice but to retire their license yeah I think that's a really beautiful and accurate point I think that it's a great opportunity. Like I, there's no way what we did in the last few years was sustainable at all. I mean, eventually all the rich people are going to run out of the cash to keep buying all these properties. And eventually we're going to need first time home buyers back in the market. Yeah. And all of us agents, like if you're not stepping up your game, you're finding a new job. So yep. I think we're going to increase the quality of our profession, which is desperately needed. Yeah, I, and I agree. With that. <laughs> it's so bad. Like we're yeah. going to elevate our profession. We're going to have a much greater balance. Our buyers don't have to like give up their firstborn and their kidney and waive all inspections. Like we can think about the house we're going to be spending a whole lot of time in and a whole lot of money on. Yeah. And I think it's great for all of us to just have a pause and reflect and improve to and navigate the future and be ready for whatever the next big thing is. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons, you know, that's in my opinion is, is the fun part about being in this business is because it's ever changing. And if you have a problem with change and continuing to learn that this is not the business for you because that's that's the whole point of it right that's so that's the reason why I got into the medical field was because I know that things were always changing I know things are always improving and so I was like I am like forever get to learn right I never get bored and stuck doing the same crap and if you enjoy that nothing against you I do it you're fantastic at it but I'm just saying that as far as real estate it's probably not going to be your um, your favorite place to stay because it is ever changing and you are always learning and if you can't do that you're not going to grow yeah, well, wow. That is just a great nugget to end on. I think that is so perfect. Thank you so much for all of your time and insight. And please tell us where the listeners can find you, where they can connect with you. Tell us all your different avenues of communication. Yeah. So uh, you can find me online. The easiest way to find me online is at Agent Services Plus. Um, that's Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is one of my um, favorite places to be. So that's the easiest way to connect with me. Um, or you can follow along on the podcast that I will actually be releasing tomorrow. It's called Real Chat with Cat. It'll be on Apple, Spotify, Google, the, the big ones. Um, and we're going to continue the conversations with amazing agents like you um, about how they grow in their business and how mindset plays into that and work on reeling in some of those tips that kind of help them get to where they're at or or where they're going. And then I've got a couple of, of flips with some coaches in there outside of the real estate world, which I'm super excited to bring into. That is so awesome. Thank you so much for all of your time and all your light and love and insight. It was so much fun talking to you. Thank and you so rock much. stars, you know where to find me. Steph Heiser does real estate. I'm always happy to talk to anyone and everyone about anything. So hit me up and find Kat and have a great day. Thanks. All right, real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Muchastegui jumping in again to thank you for listening to the show. Hopefully you guys loved listening to that one. And I wanna make sure that you know about all of the extra resources that we have. And also we need your help. They say podcasts are free. You get to listen to podcasts for free. But what is the cost of that podcast? I would say if I could beg you to pay anything for that podcast, I would say the cost of the podcast is going and giving a review. So whether you download it on Google or Apple or YouTube or anywhere else, please go give us a review. Say what you liked, what you didn't like. It helps us get better guests. The more reviews, the higher we get in the rate rankings. Right now, we are the biggest podcast out there for real estate agents. And we want to keep that spot because we know there's lots of podcasts out there. So go give us a review. Also, 
Be sure to go to hybendigital.com. If you liked any of the resources that those real estate agents talked about, we've got a huge video vault of those resources for free. Every punny that comes on the podcast that we interview, they give us something that helps them get their deals or helps them work with their clients. And we put that in the toolbox in our vault for you. So go to hybendigital.com and you can get it. If you're looking for real estate education, go to rebusuniversity.com. We have all sorts of courses in there to help agents succeed in real estate, how to get the listing, how to negotiate deals, you know, how to become an investor, all sorts of different stuff, rebusuniversity.com. And if you want to chat with me, go find me on Instagram. And if you come find me on Instagram, you can send me messages. Tell me what you want to hear. Tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. We try to put a bunch of content out there too. You can find me in two different places. It's at rerockstars.com for our real estate rockstars page or at erinamuchastegui.com for my personal Instagram page where I can chat with you about all sorts of different things. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon.